Welcome. We will begin our live webinar shortly. Welcome. We will begin our live webinar shortly. Welcome, we will begin our webinar in two minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today. Welcome to the Savings Bank Live webinar on the basics of cybersecurity hygiene. Today, you will learn how to keep your online activities and your sensitive data more secure. Our presenter is Michael Rodriguez, the Savings Bank Information Security Specialist and our subject matter expert in this area. Michael served in law enforcement for 13 years, including roles in the Department of Homeland Security Guard and Special Police. He holds a bachelor degree in information systems security, cybersecurity. 
Michael is a member of the Savings Bank Cybersecurity Committee and develops and conducts regular in-house cybersecurity training for employees. He was a keynote speaker on cybersecurity for the Wakefield Linfield Chamber of Commerce Cybersecurity Seminar in 2018. So quite the expert in the areas he will review with you today. Michael will also reference some free services available at the bank to help you increase security on your transactions. My name is Karen Benedetti, Vice President of Marketing at the bank, and I will help facilitate the webinar today. All microphones are muted during this webinar. Please type any questions into the question and answer box at the time, at any time as we go through the webinar. Please look for the icon with the question mark. We will be stopping several times during the webinar to review questions that come in up to that point in time. Now let's get started. Michael? Well, thank you, Karen. Welcome everyone to today's webinar on the basics of cybersecurity hygiene. In today's presentation, I will be covering various topics that I find are key to establishing a strong security posture. Whereas with poor personal hygiene, the body provides an ideal environment for germs to grow, leaving it vulnerable to infection. With poor cybersecurity hygiene, it leaves our digital devices and data vulnerable to software infection and data corruption. So let us start by discussing how to practice basic password hygiene. Now there are various ways passwords can be compromised. But one method is called brute force. That's when a bad actor tries a very large list of possible passwords, which are easily found on the internet, to try to guess the right one. With the right technology, they can make thousands of guesses every minute. That means a six letter password can be guessed in seconds. Most well-secured modern sites, like the ones we have here at the bank, are set up to detect when a brute force attack is occurring and can lock them out after a certain number of wrong guesses. But some are crafty and they'll just simply switch IPs to try again several more times. So how can we protect against this? Well, first we have to choose a strong password. So here are some do's and don'ts that should help you in choosing a strong password. You do want to add special characters, be they the dollar sign, the ampersand, the hashtag or pound sign, whatever you want to call that one, the exclamation mark. Just, I would suggest to stay away from adding just one and placing it right at the end of the password. It is known that most people will choose an exclamation mark and put it right at the end of their regular password, thinking that adds so much more security, but it really doesn't. You also want to make it long. I would suggest 10 or more characters. The longer, the better. Now, keep in mind, some applications will limit how many characters you can have or how few, how few characters you can have. So you have to stay within that. But if there's no implicit directions, make it long and use some special characters. Now you don't want to use any part of your company name or its initials. You don't want to use any of your name or your initials or even a loved one, a, a loved animal's name or any of their initials. You don't want to use any common phrases or words like the word password or be clever and, and type in let me in. No sequential numbers like one, two, three, or eight, nine, one, zero for the number 10. Now people often fall into these pitfalls because there are so many accounts requiring passwords these days. And these mechanisms seem creative and original enough to make the password stronger, while also allowing us the ability to retain the password easier. But it's far too common, and therefore they are tried against very early on in an attack that provides very little additional security in most cases. Now, another way passwords can be compromised is something called credential stuffing. Now, this is when a bad actor gains access to a list of usernames and passwords from a data breach that the target may have been involved in. And they try these passwords against other online accounts belonging to the target. Now, to help against this, we want to, uh, against these type of attacks, we want to have good, strong password management. If you happen to be the target, and your credentials to an account was compromised somehow. How difficult would it be for an attacker to gain access to your other accounts if all your credentials are the same? Even if they don't know what other accounts you may have, they can try them against all types of accounts until they get lucky. Grant yourself some additional peace of mind and make it harder for an attacker to get anything else. Don't reuse passwords across various sites, especially email, financial accounts, business accounts. Keep them all separate. 
Now, normally what I see happen next is people write the passwords down in a very unsecure location. Don't be the person that writes down and leaves them out in, uh, writes the password down and leaves them out in the open for anyone that happens to come by to access them. You want to store passwords securely. This does not mean tape it to the underside of the keyboard or mouse pad. Plenty of people have done that. That's one of the first places to look. If password retention seems overly difficult for you, there are password management applications on the market that could help. These applications allow users to save passwords to various accounts while digitally encrypting them for safekeeping. Then there would only be one password to remember. But if you do choose this method, please, please, please make sure to keep that password extra secure as it becomes a potential for a single point of failure. I would also suggest you enabling two-factor authentication. Now, what is this? This is, in essence, just a means of double checking that you are who you say you are. This checks against two factors instead of the usual one. The first factor is always your username and password. The second factor is one of three things, either something you know, like the answer to pre-selected questions, something you have, let's say your smartphone. So you would have entered factor one, your username and password, it would then send a pin to your cell phone or your smart device and you then enter that pin as your second factor or something you are like a biometric scan your fingerprints or your iris scan also i want to mention that there is an mfa which stands for multi-factor authentication this just means it's more than two factors now the way this helps you is because any attacker getting a hold of your credentials would still need that other authentication factor before they could have access to the data. I now want to talk about network awareness. I consider network awareness a subset of what I call situational awareness, which is of utmost importance in protection. Being aware of your environment helps protect you against harm. Being proactive. Staying away from dangerous areas is usually the best course of action whenever and wherever possible. As such, understanding the basic types of network connection options available should help, to stay in, help you in deciding what is safe to do and what is not safe. So first, let's look at the first two, which is in basics, wireless and wired. So starting in reverse order, your wired connection is a physical connection from your computer to your router or gateway. In your home, if that's the only method you have and you don't have wireless and you know where your router or your gateway is and it's locked behind closed doors, you're pretty certain that you're secure. Now, with, if you do have wireless at home, well, that brings up two other components that you have to be aware of. You have to understand that there is secured wireless and there's unsecured wireless. An unsecured wireless network can be connected to within range and without any type of security feature like a password or login. So if you have an unsecured network at home, basically you see your wireless network available and you can just select it and you're in. Well, you might think no one else has access because it's within your own home, but if that signal is powerful enough and a bad actor has a strong enough receiving antenna, they can ha now have access to your wireless and they're on your network free Wi-Fi for your neighbors. The other version is a secured wireless network, which requires a user to type in the password, register your account, or agree to a legal term before connecting. And if it's at a store, it may also require a fee or a store purchase to gain access to the password or network. Now, even if it's secured, this does not mean that your wireless is safe. Everybody else at that store has access to the same credentials, which means they're on the same network. So be careful as to what kind of transmissions you, you what kind of transactions you take on those type of Wi-Fi networks, even if you are paying for them. Now, what about that free Wi-Fi down at the coffee shop? Should I be using it? Should I not be using it? Well, first and foremost, let's go back to what we just discussed. Is this a secured or unsecured wireless? If it's unsecured, I highly state to stay away from it. Don't get on there. Don't put any sensitive information. Don't put a device on, onto a free Wi-Fi that's unsecured, um, that has anything that you want to protect. It's open for grabs. Now, if it's a secured Wi-Fi connection, so you do have to have a, a username and password, 
Again, it still doesn't mean it's safe. Anybody else on there, if they have a decent knowledge on how to and a, a malicious intent, they can access your information. Now, how do you protect yourself in the event that you have to use uh, this free Wi-Fi? Maybe you travel a lot and you have no, you don't have a mobile hotspot of your own and you have to get on free Wi-Fi. Well, I would suggest getting a VPN. Now that stands for virtual private network. And with the use of a VPN, it basically creates a tunnel between your device and that virtual network. Another potential benefit to VPN is they mask your IP with their own IP address from a different location. So you could physically be in Australia, but your VPN would show you're in a different location. Now, before I proceed, Karen, are there any questions on the last two topics we've discussed? Uh, there are no questions. I'm sure people are absorbing all this good knowledge. So uh, unless any come up this moment, we can continue and we can address all the topics at the end. Perfect. All right, let me know if anything comes through. I will now proceed to my next topic, which is website URLs and hyperlinks. So first and foremost, when discussing website URLs is to understand the basics. So when you're trying to navigate to a website, there are two locations, two general locations that you can type that into. The first is the address bar. This is where you should type the known website URL. So using our bank's URL, if I knew it, at the very top, I could type in tsbawake24.com and get to the location that I want. Now, if I don't know where I want to go, but I know the basic name, I use the search bar. And usually you can see the little magnifying glass and that's where you type in generic information. So in this instance, I'm putting in the savings bank. Now, this, once you enter it in here, you get multiple hits. When selecting from the various options, one should always remember that the first option might not always be the correct option. So if you do know the website URL, but you use the search bar, you would still want to verify that you are making the correct selection. So take a look at the URL where that link is sending you to. Now, again, it might not be at the very top, so you might have to scroll through. And in the event that you don't know what the URL is and you still want to get this information, if it's of a sensitive nature like a bank or maybe the Internal Revenue Service or something like that, I strongly suggest to get a known telephone number and call them so you can get the proper URL. The last thing you want to do is land on an incorrect website and enter sensitive information that can be compromised. Now, there are also hyperlinks embedded in emails. They can spell out the entire destination, like I have here in the example, or be labeled something entirely different, like the words click here within quotes. The destination of the link can be revealed by simply hovering over the link in the email with your cursor. Now, as you can see here in my example, and this was made by me, I just typed in that the savings bank URL is, and I'm using the correct URL. So that's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.tsbawake24.com. But by simply hovering over that with the cursor, it's actually being pointed to fakelink.com. So even if it appears correct, one should always be cognizant of what location you're going to, where it's actually trying to send you. Now, however you access the desired website, you must check the URL in the address bar. And yes, I say you must check. I know we do a lot of surfing, but we must be aware of where we're landing. Hackers can easily embed malware into sites that look authentic. Even if you're visiting a site you frequently visit, you must check that the URL is correct. You can identify a fake URL for looking by looking for spelling mistakes or if it says HTTP instead of HTTPS, you can also check for the lock sign and check for the security certificate. Hackers love to take you to a genuine looking site. And once you're there, have you enter some login credentials on that page. And now your information is compromised. Now just look at this search engine site here. Many would see this as a Google search. It says Google on the tab and in the search bar, 
It even has the colorful letters Google uses. Someone in a rush could easily pass by this and not having noticed that the URL does not actually say Google. I find that in most cases like this, many people have a gut instinct that that little, that little piece of information within you that says, hey, there's something wrong with this. There's something wrong, but because of our rush, we'll just bypass it and we just ignore it. Well, I'm here to say, please trust your gut instinct. If it seems wrong, double check it. Check something that's nagging at you might be wrong. Sites are made to appear close to the intended site in order to remain unnoticed. This allows them to implant malware, or if they wanted to collect data, they can do so for a longer period of time because you're not paying attention to that gut instinct. The more you practice looking at URLs, the easier it will become to identify the fake ones. Now moving on to my next topic, social engineering. So what is social engineering? Well, the Cambridge Dictionary defines it as attempts to trick people into giving secret or personal information, especially on the internet, and using it for harmful purposes. If you are thinking that sounds like it encompasses a lot, then I would agree with you because it does. There are many types of social engineering attacks, such as the examples shown here on screen. What makes social engineering so effective is that it plays against humanity's need to trust. Many social engineering attacks, the more effective ones especially, will attempt to elicit an emotional response from the target to further exploit the inherent trust. Baiting, for the example, which is the first one here on the left, that's when an attacker leaves a malware infected physical device, such as a USB flash drive, in a place that is sure to be found. The intent here is that you might think, hey, someone forgot something. Somebody, uh, someone left their flash drive. Let me see who it might belong to. And what's the first instinct? You're gonna plug it into your device. And with that malicious software on there, they could easily upload your information over to the internet and potentially get, gather all your financial data or whatever it is that they may be looking for. They might actually lock your computer instead. Let's look at a phishing example next. Here we have an email pretending to come from the IRS saying that they are reporting a criminal complaint of tax evasion against this target. The hope here is that the target recognizes that the IRS is a trusted name and that logo is a trusted one, while eliciting an emotional response by stating there was a criminal complaint being filed against them, and then offering up more detailed information about the, this complaint against them, if only they would click on the link. The link states starts a malicious file download from a hacked website, causing unknown results to the target's computer. If only they would have paused one minute, hovered over the hyperlink to reveal the true destination. Maybe they could have avoided getting the malware. Well, hopefully the target has good endpoint protection software, also referred to as antivirus or anti-malware software, which is what I want to speak about next. The job of any good endpoint protection software is to protect against known malicious software in the event they get onto your device. Some even protect based on an individual's behavioral habits. Now, I would strongly suggest to all users to invest in the purchase of some sort of antivirus or anti-malware software, because even while we're practicing what we have learned so far, there is never a guarantee that we will be 100% protected against any of the many, many, many malicious programs there are out there. To be clear, any computing device is susceptible to malware, especially if we ourselves allow it in. And unfortunately, these programs are not 100% effective either. There is no one solid, pure solution to keep you completely safe. There are always new programs being created out there that the antivirus software will not recognize. Which brings me to my next topic. If your data is compromised, but not stolen by the malware, maybe you become the target of a ransomware attack and your computer is locked up, preventing you from accessing all your data, now what? Well, you always have the option of paying the ransom, right? In hopes that maybe they'll let go of your, uh, your information, but there's no guarantee. Or what if the malware is a worm that just destroys all the data on your computer? 
For scenarios such as these, it's always important to back up all of your important data. And what is important? Whatever you decide it is. Nowadays, storage is fairly cheap, so it makes the most amount of sense to just back up everything. You might save a few pennies by only storing what you absolutely can't replace, but the low cost means most computer users will want to back up everything. But how do you back up your data? There are various options. Each has its own pros and cons. I'm only naming a few here, and let's go over them. So a backup service is basically, let's call it a butler service for all of your backup needs. It takes your data and it backs it up to the cloud, but someone else is managing it for you. So you're paying another organization to take your data and secure it for you. You might even pay them to monitor and alert you in case the backups are not functioning. What's great about this is you can have someone do the work for you in case you don't know too much about how to back up or who to back up or what to back up or when, et cetera, et cetera. The downfalls of this is you need to trust in that service provider. Additional benefit to this, it's in the cloud. So that means as long as you have internet act access, you can access that data potentially from anywhere. Another drawback, because it's internet based and it's being sent to the cloud, if you don't have internet, those backups aren't being stored and you don't have access to that data. Now, the other option is a regular cloud storage, uh, cloud backup system. There's many of these today. The difference between this and a backup service is you manage it yourself. So you decide what you want to back up, how often, and to where. And you have to set up your own alerts or monitor it to make sure that your backup has enough storage and that it's constantly backing up. Again, like the backup service, this is internet based because it's going to the cloud. And therefore, it needs internet access to be able to provide your data to the cloud. And the good benefit to this, just like the backup service, being internet based, you do have access to that data so long as you have internet connectivity. Now, finally, on this list is external hard drives. Now, this is an external storage device that you connect directly to the device that has the data that you want backed up. The benefit to this is that you do not need internet access to continuously back up your data. You do have to maintain it yourself most of the time. So you do have to tell it what to back up, when to back up, how often to do the backup. And it's great because if the internet goes down, you, your data is still secure. A con on this is you don't have access from anywhere. You have to be physically present. And heaven forbid something happened to the location where your device is, well, that's where your backup is also. So if it's a flood or a fire, well, both devices could potentially be damaged, and so you still lose your, your data. I generally would suggest if for you need to back up really important data, a mixture of the two, perhaps a hard drive and a cloud storage, be it a uh, service or not. That way you can guarantee that you have a backup of a backup. You have that local backup that if the internet goes down, your data is still being backed up, and you've got that cloud backup so you can also access your information wherever you have internet access. Now, before I move on to the question and answer portion of this presentation, I'm just going to touch on some of the free programs the bank has to offer you to help better protect yourself and your money. First off, we're excited about our free credit monitoring service available within online and mobile banking. It's called Credit Score. This gives you instant access to your credit score and your credit report, and you can receive alerts about major credit changes to help quickly identify potentially fraudulent activity. Card Valet gives you security on your debit card, which is even more important now as we're engaging in more transactions where you provide your card number by phone or online. You can turn cards on or off immediately, get notified when your card is used, and set spending limits and limit use by location. Notify is another service available free of charge with real-time account alerts, including account balances and withdrawals, with notifications by text or email. Finally, receiving monthly bank statements online is actually safer than mail by avoiding the risk of your paper statement landing in the wrong hands. E-statements are stored in a secure online environment and you can receive email notifications when new statements are available. 
If you want more information on any of these products, please visit our website at tsbawake24.com. Karen, are there any questions that I can potentially answer? Yes, there are. The first one is, where can I get a VPN? Ah, excellent question. So there are many, many different VPN subscribers. Um, although I cannot endorse any particular one, they, I must caution against the fact that there are some free ones and there are paid for ones. I would strongly suggest in doing a search on the different VPN sources, you can even do a simple search as such as uh, the best VPNs of 2020 or 2021 and just do some comparisons. Maybe even talk to your internet service provider and see if they provide a VPN service or if they have a resource that can potentially tell you more and give you more information about the VPNs. But those are very valuable uh, resources indeed. Thank you, Michael. The next question is, is it safe to bookmark a known URL? Yes, if you know it's safe, by all means, go ahead and bookmark the, the known URL. You want to try to avoid saving the password of that URL if it's not in a secure method, if it's not a password management application that's storing your password. The reason for this is if you save passwords in a uh, browser, it's actually fairly easy for any individual with uh, moderate IT knowledge or skill to be able to see and take that password. Again, if you're also not following some of the examples that I mentioned and you do have that password for multiple different accounts, I now would have, if I'm the attacker, all the, the passwords to all of your other accounts. So bookmarking it, I know which sites you're going to as the attacker, and then if you're also saving that password, I might be able to take that from you. But if you avoid that, the bookmarks are good. They're a good time saver. And I would just make sure, because sometimes browsers could be hijacked, that the page that you're landing on, you still want to take a look at the URL. So you've used your bookmark, look at the URL. Eventually, you'll get used to seeing what the URL is supposed to look like. And if you get that little gut instinct saying, hmm, there's something wrong here, just Take a second, take a look, and see that you're on the right location. And leading and staying on URLs, will a fake URL always show the real address when you hover over it? So if you hover over a URL that ends up being fake, will it show the real address? So what will happen? So yes, if you're on a page, be it your email or, or the internet, if you hover over a URL, um, or any kind of hyperlink, you will see the destination that it is pointing to. So if it's the full one, as I showed in my example, you should be able to see that it's pointing directly to that location. And if it's just a click here for more info, it'll show you where it's going. And if it doesn't look right, don't click on it. Thank you, Michael. Our next question is, I am using a laptop for work purposes that I do not connect to the internet. Is this laptop safe from being hacked or do I still need malware software installed? Do I still need malware installed? So they're not connecting to the internet. Should they still install malware protection? I would generally need a little bit more information on that, but let's, let's assume that because it's being used for work, there are documents or files being added to it, maybe from a flash drive you don't always know if that flash drive is secure. So yes, malware can always end up on that device. Plus now, since it is a laptop, are you watching it 100% of the time? Who has access to the laptop? Did you leave it down somewhere? If you went to the coffee shop, for example, knowing your Wi-Fi is turned off and you got up from your laptop to go grab your order and you left your laptop there because it was only five feet away, someone might still have had access. I have a USB in my possession that can uh, inject keystrokes at 3000 characters per minute. So as long as I have the program and I have access, I can get in there and, and put something on there. So I still would strongly suggest about getting uh, anti-malware, antivirus software on that device. And there are no more questions. And I will point out that if you arrived late, or just want to watch the webinar again, the video re 